Have you ever wondered what drives GDP growth? Have you ever wondered how, how much money you need to have in retirement? What is enough? Do you know what an IRA is? Of course you do. You know what, do you know what the disadvantages of an IRA are though? If you want to answer to these questions, then stay tuned because today, folks, we're going to be talking about all of that. Retiring Well, brought to you by Centennial Wealth Advisory, financial advisors specializing in retirement planning and serving all of Northern Michigan. Retiring Well, helping you plan for a successful and comfortable retirement. Retiring Well, plan to retire well. What drives GDP growth? Now, knowing GDP growth is huge because the definition of a recession is when you've had two quarters in a row of negative GDP growth. So, so how do we know when GDP growth is strong? You know, well, we get the, we get the quarterly results, they measure it, but what drives it, right? This is a question a lot of people have. What mainly drives GDP growth? Is it manufacturing? Is it consumer spending? Well, believe it or not, 69% of what drives our GDP growth is consumer spending. Now, now another 18% is what, what is in uh, small business spending, okay? So as a general rule, you've got 87% of our GDP is driven by consumer spending, small business spending, huge. So how consumers feel, how small business feels is a big, big factor. Well, what I want to talk about today in this segment is, is what, what are factors that drive our ability to spend? Okay, key point. Well, one thing is low interest rates. When interest rates are low, um, you know, that, that's, that, that gives us more ability to spend because what? If we don't have more money going out towards interest, that means we have more money in our pocket, which means we have the ability to spend more when we're dealing with lower interest rates. Now, would you not agree um, that in this low rate environment, imagine a world where interest rates were double what they are. Could you see how that could have a huge impact on people's ability to spend and ultimately our GDP. Another factor that affects our ability to spend is what we call the ease to afford debt. You know, where are we at in our debt, debt uh, our net worth to debt per se? If we're highly leveraged, uh, meaning we're high, more highly in debt, then our ability to spend more above and beyond that is going to get less and less and less. So that's a huge, huge factor. Um, as we've seen, you know, well, let me just give you a great example. Look at the, the talk we've had with student loans. Right? These kids are getting out of college. They're maybe even getting into jobs if they're fortunate enough to get a job, but because they're strapped with such high student loans, what's their ability to afford anymore? A lot less, isn't it? The other thing that drives somebody's ability to spend is uh, wage growth. You know, for, for obvious reasons, if, if you've got more, you, your wages are increasing, you got more money in your pocket again, right? You have more, you have an ability to spend more. And that's been a huge uh, um, talk these days about, you know, how we seem to be, you know, the economy's doing well, it's growing, but wages haven't necessarily been keeping up, keeping pace with that. So huge factor. Now, the other thing that drives spending is our willingness to spend. You know, it, our ability to spend is one thing, but what is our willingness to spend it if we have it? Well, one, again, is going back to our confidence. You know, what is consumer confidence? How do we feel about how things are going on in the economy? When we hear things like recession coming, and we hear that more times than not, what does that kind of cause us to do? It, it kind of lowers our confidence in, in, in willingness to spend, and then when we spend less, it's kind of self-fulfilling prophecy now, right? Because if we're not spending, and consumer confidence is a big part of that, then GDP is going to uh, is going to uh, is going to suffer accordingly. Small business confidence, another huge factor. Um, small business, if they're feeling good about the economy, they're, they're hiring more people, maybe they're making more capital improvements, they're trying to expand their business. Um, and again, this being such a significant factor in our GDP growth, their confidence level is gonna be just as important as the consumer confidence level. So those two factors in our willingness to spend is really gonna be about our confidence in how the economy 
economy is doing. Now, there's all this talk about recession coming. We know it's coming. It's just a matter of time. Markets are cyclical. I've talked about this before. You'll have times of expansion followed by times of contraction. So we know those times are coming. It's just a matter of when. But the third factor that affects these things is what's called the performance of your financial assets. If your accounts are doing well, you're going to feel more willing to spend, right? If they're not doing so well, so well you're going to cut back. That was a lot of great information, Larry. Thanks for sharing that. And guys, this the thing that comes to my mind is back to 2008 and the recession and, and how big of a role that played potentially in your lives as well as, as maybe you were looking at your expenses and trying to determine what are some of those items that maybe it can cut out of, of the expenses that you had. And, and really it comes back to looking at a budget. I know that's something that a lot of times people don't want to spend the time or energy to, to look through those expenses, but it, it becomes so important to understand where you're at and, and in our business working with folks that are just like you, either in retirement or getting close to retirement really getting a good understanding of what your expenses look like is going to be key. John, that's really interesting. You're exactly right. You know, in times like we're in right now where the market's been good for a while, people tend to get lackadaisical with what their plan is and what their retirement future holds for them. And it's all the better reasons to have a concrete retirement plan. If you're, let's say, 10 years away from retirement or less, you really should have a written plan in place. You should know what your income is going to look like. What are those sources? And also, how can a market impact those and what that would look like? You know, you don't want to have to work five years or more longer just because the markets don't cooperate exactly exactly how you think they will or want them to. So have a plan. Know what that looks like, not only from an income basis, investment, taxes, and estate plan. That way, if times roll around that are negative, they might not impact you so much. Yeah, guys, it, it, it's been been disheartening when you hear all this, this talk in the news about recession coming, right? Recession coming. And, you know, people feel like when they hear the word recession, they're thinking, oh boy, another 08, I better tighten my belt. But as we, as we discussed, 87% um, of GDP growth being consumer spending, small business sentiment, sentiment, as soon as they start to hear words of recession, they start tightening the belt and it kind of becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, as soon as they start tightening their belt, now we're going to start to see some slow growth. So, you know, I, we want to be very careful to let our audience know that when they talk about these early signs of uh, recession, yes, there's some leading indicators, but it doesn't mean we're in it right now. Doesn't mean we shouldn't start tightening the belt and kind of getting our finances in order either. Uh, really, we should. But um, anyway, in the next segment, I'm going to be talking about the three things that you need to be working towards, towards retirement. And then, guys, basically a 10,000 foot view of what an income plan looks like. So stay tuned. Today's retirement challenges can be mastered. Knowledge is power because you can confidently plan ahead and make educated financial decisions for a successful and comfortable retirement. We are Centennial Wealth Advisory, financial advisors, specializing in retirement planning, serving all of Northern Michigan with offices in Traverse City, Cadillac, Petoskey, and Gaylord. And we invite you to an informative and exciting live event with a complimentary gourmet dinner. You'll learn highlights of the new Tax Reform Act, the difference between the fiduciary and suitability standard of care, how an IRA gets taxed to a surviving spouse, what a bull market is and how long it can last, and much more. Call 888-608-5825 to register and choose the date and location that works best for you. Wednesday, September 18th, or Thursday, September 26th, at Boone's Long Lake Inn in Traverse City. The live event starts at 6 p.m. and is free to attend with a complimentary gourmet dinner to follow, but seating is limited and fills quickly. Call 888-608-5825 to reserve your seats today. There is no cost and no obligation. Don't miss this important live event. Educated financial decisions. Call 888-608-5825 today. 
If you're retiring soon, it's likely you have many decisions ahead of you. One of the larger ones is Social Security. How are you going to take it? Are you going to take it early? Are you going to take it at your full retirement age? Or maybe even delay it? Social Security needs to be viewed as an asset. If you live a long life, it's likely you can collect a large sum of money over time with those payments directed to you. How though folks misjudge Social Security commonly is how it's taxed. How are you going to pay tax on that for the rest of your life? And it's important to factor that in when to take it. And also paired with your other assets you may have, it may make great differences as well. If you don't have a Social Security tax plan built into your retirement, it's extremely important and could cost you thousands over your lifetime if done improperly. We would love to sit down with you here at Centennial Wealth Advisory and talk through what that looks like on a larger scale and see if we can help you have a successful retirement. All right, in this segment of Chalk Talk, I want to show you, you know, the three things you need to be working towards, towards retirement, okay? And then, and then how much money, or how much uh, money do I have to have in savings to make retirement happen comfortably for me? So let me just kind of illustrate. I call this D-Day, but really folks, all that is is retirement day. What, you know, what is that age at which you want to retire? Now, one thing that's going to be very important as you work towards retirement is, is the, the one I think you need to be working on is no debt. <laughs> now, think about this. Can you imagine being in retirement and happen to deal with a mortgage payment still? Um, not, not, not likely, right? So that's something you want to be working on. If I'm 30 years away from retirement, that's D-Day for me is 30 years away, and I've got a 30-year mortgage, I think I'm fairly okay to, uh, in making sure that my debt's on track to pay, be paid off. But if I'm only 10 years away from retirement and I'm still sitting on a 30-year mortgage, not so good. The second thing you want to be working towards is Social Security. Now, I know a lot of us don't think it's going to be there. <laughs> it's going to be there, especially for the boomers. You've been paying into this for a lot of years. Um, many of you are counting on this to be there. So um, let's just hope that our politicians can do something to, to, to rectify it. I think some of them already are. But think about it. If I've got no debt and I've got Social Security, now for the average American, I think the last statistic I heard is the average person's getting about $1,300 a month. So if you're a married couple, that's probably about $2,600 a month. If I don't have any debt and I got $2,600 a month coming in, it's, it's giving me my necessities, right? I'm not living high on the hog, but I'm, I'm possibly getting by meagerly. But the big thing you want to be also working for, looking forward to towards retirement, is your savings. Folks, that's everything else. That's money you're putting into retirement accounts. That's the, the money you're, you're, you're putting just off to the side. Listen, how well you retire is going to be based on how much you put here. Now, the next big question people ask is, how much do I have to have in savings? You know, what is, what is that number? Well, let me start giving you kind of a 10,000 foot view on, you know, how to kind of work through this. But let's just say I'm that person that believes in today's dollars, I need or want maybe $60,000 per year for income. That'd be $5,000 per month. And let's say that between my spouse and I, all right, I know that I'm going to have $30,000 coming in in Social Security. Okay, now I might have had a small pension out there. Let's say that's maybe $10,000 a year. So if I need or want 60,000 and I've got 30,000 coming in from Social Security, I got another 10,000 a year coming in in maybe pension income, what's the difference? Well, do the math and the difference is gonna be $20,000 per year. That's, where, where's that gonna come from? Well, guess what folks? It's going to have to come from our savings. So how much money does that really need to be if I'm going to equate, equate it as an income? Well, as a general rule, if I want to pull 5% out for income from my portfolio, and that, now that's not brain surgery, folks. All we're saying is that if my account is growing by at least 5% and I'm pulling 5%, then all I'm doing is taking the cream off the top, right? So as a factor, I can take 20,000, and if I take that times 20, to give me a 5% return, what's that gonna be? That's gonna be basically 400,000. That's how much I should have in savings. So if I take 400,000 and I take 
Take that times 5%, I'm getting 20,000, which makes up my difference. You follow me? Now, maybe I'm somebody that wants that to be more like 4%, meaning I only want to pull 4% off the top because I don't feel comfortable pulling 5% off. That, that would even be a better scenario, right? Well, now, as a factor, you want to take 4%, divide that by 100, that's 25. So now I want to take that 20,000 times 25, and now that tells me I have to have a savings of $500,000. And again, do the math. If I take 500 times 4%, it's going to give me my 20,000. Now, obviously, that number looks different if you go to 3%, right? And you get even more comfortable. But I, again, you know, you get more detail when you do a detailed income plan, but this kind of gives you a 10,000 foot view of what you need to start working towards as you get to retirement. An income plan is very important, so I encourage you, give us a call if you're somebody that hasn't worked out this in detail and you really want to answer those questions, then give us a call. Larry, I really like that idea, the 10,000 foot view. And so often when we're sitting down with folks just like you in a first meeting, just to understand where you're at and what you're trying to accomplish, we'll step back and just sort of look at some of those numbers of, okay, what is your desired income? What does Social Security provide? What is, if you have a pension, what does that look like? And so often uh, I just, I, I get this sense of relief from, from folks just like you that are sitting there saying, wow, it is possible that I can retire. And then, you know, obviously we're looking at it again from that 10,000 foot view, but then we dive a lot deeper into a very detailed income plan, which, which leads to talking about Social Security, right, Art? Absolutely. You know, it always amazes me when we have these conversations, and as Larry talked about in this recent Chalk Talk, this 10,000 foot view, how few people have walked through that exercise of having that done. You know, there's so many choices in retirement. You know, you've worked now for 20, 30, 40 years, and what does retirement look like. You could live another 20, 30, 40 years and you need to be prepared for that. With Social Security, you know, it's not just as simple as saying, yep, I'm going to collect it at 62 or oh, I'm going to wait till my full retirement age. There's other options out there and not only just the fact of when you're going to start it, but what do taxes look like in that timeline? How does that impact your portfolio and your overall in net income and, and value that you may have? You know, guys, there's a lot of more choices out there that I, I, I wish people were more aware of. Yeah, there's a lot of pieces to the puzzle. I mean, the biggest question we get when people come into the office, if they've got their savings, they've got their retirement, is, is, is this enough? Do I have enough? Can I pull the trigger on retirement? And as John indicated, having a detailed plan is very, very important. But sometimes we have to just kind of uh, do some quick observations, do the 10,000 foot view as a call, and see if all the pieces of the puzzle are there. Anyway, why don't you stay tuned because what I'm going to talk about in the next segment is going to be the disadvantages of IRAs. We know the advantages, they're great tax deduction tools in our working years, when we're especially maybe in a high bracket, but why they can be disadvantageous once we get to retirement. So stay tuned. to helping you plan to retire well. Hi there, my name is Nick Greenman. I'm one of the financial advisors here at Centennial Wealth Advisory. Uh, brand new to the Gaylord office, I'm here full time now and also be commuting back to the Petoskey office as well. Um, I'd love to hear your story and learn if I could help you uh, manage your retirement needs. Hi, my name is Jack Clunder and I'm a financial advisor with Centennial Wealth Advisory. We are now opening an office in the Cadillac area and surrounding cities. So if you have any retirement goals or questions that you'd like to go over, we have a no obligation free consultation. Please feel free to reach out to us and we'd love to meet with you.
Now I want to be really careful in this segment because I want to talk about the disadvantages of IRAs, but I want to be careful not to gloss over the advantages. Um, when we put into these qualified accounts, as they're called, whether they be 401ks or IRAs or 457s or 403b plans, and by the way, folks, all those are is IRS tax code numbers for those sections. But qualified plans are great because when we're in our working years, most potentially in a higher tax bracket, at putting into these plans gives us a great tax deduction. Um, it creates forced savings for us, right? And especially if we're in a 401k and the employer is matching, why wouldn't we want to take advantage of that? So there are, there are a lot of great reasons why we want to be putting into these kind of a plans as we work towards retirement. But it's also important to understand the disadvantages of these plans because sometimes you can get, get caught up in putting all your eggs in one basket and you may not want to do that because you want to understand the disadvantages. Well, one of the big ones, the most glaring one, is that even though we got a tax deduction for putting into those plans, even though those plans grew tax deferred, meaning as they, they grew, we didn't have to pay any tax, guess what? Nobody's paid any tax. <laughs> and someday, um, when we go to pull money out of these plans, we're gonna have to pay tax on them. So huge disadvantage if all our money is, is in that bucket, um, then now every dollar we're pulling out is taxable and it really makes tax planning very hard. A second disadvantage is that when it comes to how much our Social Security is taxable, it can kind of create a little double taxation. So let me just give you a scenario. You know, I've got, maybe I'm pulling out of my Social Security, and now, based on the IRS tax code, and this can happen, there's certain thresholds that if you meet with your income, now some of your Social Security can be taxable income. Now that's a whole segment in itself, which I, I'll, I'll talk about some other time, but just, just follow me with this on this. So now I'm going to pull out of my IRA. Now I know it's taxable. I've just pulled a dollar out and it's taxable, but because of these thresholds and these formulas, now it's created, at the same time, created some of my Social Security to be taxable at the same time. Can you see now how it's caused some double taxation? Now I'm paying tax on one dollar, but potentially another dollar at the same time. Even if I'm in that lower tax bracket, let's say the 12% tax bracket, and this scenario is playing out, now I'm paying 24 cents on, the, on that dollar I just pulled out. So that can be kind of a disadvantage. A third disadvantage is, is what we call those required minimum distributions. Because this is money that's never been taxed, Uncle Sam wants their, their share, right? So they set this age limit that says that once you hit this age, you now are forced to take money out of these accounts. Now I think once you, the, the age is 70 and a half when it first starts and the year you turn 70 and a half, and then every year thereafter, this, this percentage increases. I think in the first year, it's like three and a half percent. If you live to age 105, would you believe it or not, it gets to be 50% <laughs> is what they require. So it's the only, it's one of those very few asset classes that actually force you to pull it out whether you want to or not. So that you got that playing out. Another disadvantage is it's probably the worst asset you can leave to a surviving spouse. First of all, you know, if that surviving spouse wants the same income, they're gonna find some things that just hit them now from a tax standpoint that they didn't have before. First of all, they only get half the standard deduction that you guys got when you were both um, married and, and living, right? Um, now, those brackets I was telling you about with Social Security with those thresholds, they're actually lower on the single taxpayer route. So even if you had the same income, now you're going to find more of the Social Security in ta income taxable, which wasn't there possibly before, and now they're in the single tax rates. Now, uh, this is a whole show in itself too that we'd love to you know, revisit, but basically it's all of a sudden you're taking money out from a, t from a tax standpoint from the IRS. IRA and it's getting taxed higher at the, at the surviving spouse rate than it was when you're married. So folks, you know, again, don't want to disparage being in retirement accounts and saving. Um, they're great retirement vehicles, but maybe having all your eggs in just that basket might not be a good idea. Wouldn't you find it valuable to, to, to maybe have some tax planning or what we call an IRA exit strategy to find out how you want to maybe get that 
Uncle Sam maybe out of those accounts so you can lessen the tax impact. So hopefully you found this valuable. Thank you. Today's retirement challenges can be mastered. Knowledge is power because you can confidently plan ahead and make educated financial decisions for a successful and comfortable retirement. We are Centennial Wealth Advisory, financial advisors specializing in retirement planning, serving all of Northern Michigan with offices in Traverse City, Cadillac, Petoskey, and Gaylord. And we invite you to an informative and exciting live event with a complimentary gourmet dinner. You'll learn highlights of the new Tax Reform Act, the difference between the fiduciary and suitability standard of care, how an IRA gets taxed to a surviving spouse, what a bull market is and how long it can last, and much more. Call 888-608-5825 to register and choose the date and location that works best for you. Wednesday, September 18th, or Thursday, September 26th, at Boone's Long Lake Inn in Traverse City. The live event starts at 6 p.m. and is free to attend with a complimentary gourmet dinner to follow, but seating is limited and fills quickly. Call 888-608-5825 to reserve your seats today. There is no cost and no obligation. Don't miss this important live event. Educated financial decisions. Call 888-608-5825 today. Yeah, guys, we don't want to be all negative about these IRAs because they are ultimately a great savings tool for your 401k, your IRA, these retirement plans where you're, you're putting money aside to build that up. Um, but the big concern that we have is then uh, ultimately that exit strategy. When it comes time where you're retired and starting to draw an income stream, that's where it can be become a major concern because if you have those bigger purchases that may come up, a lot of times people will come and say, hey, I'd really like to buy a truck when I get to retirement or buy those, those four wheelers or whatever type of fun that they wanna have in retirement, but the only bucket of money they have to choose from sometimes is IRA and it's all taxable when it comes out, Art. Right, and it's interesting, John. It's, uh, you know, when people get into retirement, they may want that bigger purchase that they kind of been in their mind saving for their entire life or their working years. They want that RV or some, you know, if you have a $40,000 purchase, let's say, you might have to take 60, 65, 70 out, depending upon your tax bracket, and that can be devastating on your overall income plan. So at best, in most cases, just like investments, and not to have all your eggs in one baskets, you know, IRA, you know, pre-tax, Roth, after-tax, or maybe some non-qualified money, it gives us a chance as planners to have some different levers we can pull to help better your tax situation, not only today, but the foreseeable future, and maybe even for your beneficiaries or surviving spouses down the road. Yeah, or it's funny, we'll have people say, you know, Larry, I'm maxing, my, maxing out my 401k, I'm maxing out my IRA, I can't put anything more into these plans. So if, you know, if I just put it over here in the savings account, is that fine? And, and I'm like, that's absolutely fine because we want to grow those kind of dollars too. Again, not having all our eggs in one basket is a key. Now listen, if you got anything out of this segment, you, you got to understand that um, you, know, you, you probably know you need an IRA exit strategy. Um, you, you've got these retirement accounts, you got a partner in those accounts, it's Uncle Sam. So how to get that partner out is going to be vitally important and tax planning is going to be key to that. So if this has been of interest to you or you want to um, learn more about how, to, how an IRA exit plan might be appropriate to you, then give us a call.